Hey microbiology students, this lecture video is on the pathogens of the respiratory system. As you can see, I still have my number one fan here. Taking a bath. All right, pathogens of the respiratory system. Let us take a look. So the respiratory system, overview of the anatomy, we generally group it into upper and lower respiratory tract, where conditions of the upper respiratory tract are less severe um, compared to lower respiratory tract. The lungs, very fragile part of the body, don't want that infected. As far as the microflora go, notice upper respiratory tract is colonized, lower respiratory tract is not. Shouldn't be any bacteria growing in the lungs. We'll mention one upper respiratory tract infection and then we'll move into lower respiratory tract infections as our main focus today. Ear infections called otitis media. Here you can see the anatomy difference between infants and adults. It has to do with the eustachian tubes so the reason why children are more likely to develop ear infections compared to adults, well, their station tubes are shorter. They're also vertical in alignment. So that means that it's a straight shot from the nose to the ear, okay? Compared to adults, because our station tubes are longer, plus they are angled upwards, that prevents the bacteria from climbing up to the ear. There's a number of pathogens that are associated with ear infections, one of which is our good friend Staph aureus, our pathogenic Staphylococcus that was the focus of last lecture. Um, in addition, Pseudomonas, uh, P. aeruginosa, can also be a cause of um, ear infections. So now let's talk about bacterial pneumonia. And we've talked a little bit before when we were talking about coronavirus um, pathogenesis. I had talked about the alveoli and how we have these little air sacs at the tips of our bronchioles called alveoli. And they're only one cell thick and they're really important because they're lined with the capillaries that um, facilitate gas exchange. We don't want that the alveoli filled with fluid because that would minimize gas exchange. We want them filled with air, so little air sacs. And so if we get fluid in, in the alveoli, we have a condition called pneumonia, inflammation of the lungs. Pneumonia can be caused by viruses in addition to bacteria. So remember right now we are on the focus of bacterial pathogens. So we're focusing on bacterial pneumonia, the leading cause of death by infectious disease in the United States. Although we have our at-risk groups, immunocompromised, elderly, and infants. Common symptoms, shortness of breath, a cough, a fever, chest pain, increased respiratory rate. So those are really common features that are related to a pneumonia-like condition that can also be the same exact signs and symptoms of a viral pneumonia infection. Um, bacterial pneumonia in general compared to viral, bacterial pneumonia will, uh, there will be a more rapid onset of symptoms compared to viral pneumonia, it's a little more delayed with a longer incubation time. Bacterial pneumonia can be a very fast incubation time because the bacteria can reproduce so, so very quickly, exponentially. So now in the next few slides, I'm gonna outline the, the most common culprits, the bacterial pathogens that commonly cause uh, bacterial pneumonia. So Streptococcus pneumoniae, remember we meant this this guy briefly in the last lecture video when we were talking about pathogenic cocci, recall this one has an alpha hemolytic pattern on blood auger. It would be capsule positive. Although it's in the genus Streptococcus, its morphology is actually diplococci. 
So a little paired diplococci with a, a little halo around it. Of course, that would be our that would be our capsule here. So it's listed here in the most common cause of bacterial pneumonia, and it's called pneumococcal pneumonia. Somebody contracts um, pneumonia caused by Streptococcus pneumoniae. There is a preventative vaccine. It's called the pneumococcal subunit vaccine, and it is part of the vaccine, vaccination schedule for children under five. Klebsiella pneumoniae, a gram-negative bacillus. This one causes the most severe form of bacterial pneumonia with a very high mortality rate at 50%. Transmission is usually by fomites, although it can be by, dromite, by droplet. In other words, people coughing close by, but those droplets can land on fomites, on objects, right? And then somebody touches those objects and then touches their face. Disease progression. This one has a very characteristic um, sign of the infection and it's coughing up blood jelly. We call sputum basically mucus uh, or pus that is accumulating in the lungs as a result of inflammation and in white blood cells and all of that. And so the patient will cough up what looks like blood jelly. So it literally looks like strawberry jam. <laughs> um, and that is indicative of very, very severe lung damage. The good news is even though this is a very severe form of pneumonia, Klebsiella pneumoniae is a um, pretty big deal, but it only infects people who are generally immunocompromised. So there's definitely the at-risk groups that are high risk. Other causes, here's Pseudomonas aeruginosa again, usually acting as an opportunistic, which means that in healthy people, here it is here in the giant mi microbe form, um, in healthy people, normally it doesn't cause disease. And if you recall, if you're really, really good in your memory, you might even remember that we use Pseudomonas in the laboratory in our classroom. So we handle it in our labs so that tells you that it's generally not pathogenic, only in people who are uh, immunocompromised. Other forms, other uh, culprits, mycoplasma. Uh, mycoplasma is a rare group of bacteria that has no cell wall. Remember, in general, we classify bacteria as gram positive or gram negative, so it's neither. It doesn't have a cell wall. It also causes a very mild form of pneumonia that might be related, actually, the reason why it's more mild is that it's less hardy um, because of the lack of the cell wall. Sometimes people with mycoplasma pneumonia have what, what's called walking pneumonia. What that means is that they have very mild symptoms, and even though they have pneumonia, they're still up and walking around and not as um, severely compromised in their health and well-being as some of the other patients um, with pneumonia. And then there's Haemophilus influenza. This one's preventative. Uh, there's a prevention, the Hib vaccine. So we see Pedia Hib here, the, one of the childhood vac vaccines. And this, this one is found in children under five. So children under five are at risk for bacterial pneumonia. They're also at risk for meningitis, bacterial men meningitis, which is also caused by, by Haemophilus influenza. Haemophilus influenza, by the way, is not the cause of influenza. This is what I like to call and what is called a misnomer. What that means is that in the discovery, some in this discovery process, sometimes scientists make errors in naming things. And this is a misnomer because Haemophilus influenza is not the cause of influenza. Influenza or the flu is caused by the influenza virus. But what happened was when the Spanish flu um, occurred, and you're hearing a lot about that lately because that was the last uh, worldwide pandemic of um, epic proportions that is in our history books. In 1918, the H1N1 influenza that also had a 3% mortality rate like coronavirus. But because it was 1918 and we didn't have the technology or the understanding that we do now, plus it was wartime conditions. So there was a lot of worldwide travel in close 
people living in close proximity and bunkers and all that and um, military camps. On a side note, the 1918 flu killed about 50 million people worldwide. It was a huge, huge pandemic, but the same mortality rate, actually, as the disease we're, we're, we're dealing with right now, the COVID-19. Anyways, the Spanish flu, um, when they started culturing the sputum, people were coughing, they developed a pneumonia, okay, from the flu. Uh, infection, similar to what we're seeing today with the coronavirus. And they cultured the sputum samples, but they were culturing Haemophilus influenza. They were culturing this bacteria because they didn't have a way to culture viruses and they didn't actually know it was a virus that was causing the flu. So they were culturing bacteria, and that's actually really common in viral pneumonia for there to be, um, or in viral diseases for there to be what we call a comorbidity. So there's another pathogen that has taken hold in the body because the body's already weak fighting a viral infection. And so then a secondary infection comes in, usually a bacteria. We call that a co comorbidity. So what was happening is these flu patients had influenza caused by flu virus, but they had a secondary infection caused by Haemophilus influenza. And so that was what they were culturing in Petri dishes. So they thought it was the cause of the Spanish flu. And they named it Haemophilus influenza, thinking it was the cause of the flu when it was not. Okay, so it's what we call a misnomer. It's not properly named. It's not the cause of flu. Um, but the name has stuck, as sometimes that happens as well. But it doesn't cause the flu. It's just improperly named. Okay, moving on. Bordetella pertussis. Bordetella pertussis is caused, uh, causes whooping cough, also known as pertussis, highly contagious. Remember this value from last week's lectures, we talked about the r naught, And remember the r naught basically tells you how many secondary infections would result from a primary infection. So if somebody has whooping cough and they're actively coughing into the environment, how many people would they infect? Would one person infect? It's a huge number, it's between five to 15. Highly contagious. Okay, so this, this uh, bacteria has a number of virulence factors. Pertussis toxin in particular is very damaging. And what happens is it starts relatively mild and then people develop a fever and then they develop um, a very characteristic cough. OK, that makes it very difficult for them to breathe. They struggle to breathe. They die from this prolonged hypoxia, brain damage. Um, they can have collapsed lungs. Um, they can develop a secondary infection. You know, um, antibiotics work, but usually only during early phase um, before that toxin gets released. Sometimes it's referred to as the 100 day cough because it's one to six weeks of a pretty um, significant um, cough, it's preventable. It's preventable by the DTaP vaccine. Please know what the three components, what the three antigens are that are in the DTaP vaccine. We're gonna learn all of them, okay? If you don't know what they are, learn it now. So the DTaP vaccine, the first one we're gonna learn is what the A and the P stand for. It stands for acellular pertussis. So there's, it's a subunit from the pertussis bacteria. It's just a, a protein from the pertussis bacteria. It's a subunit vaccine. The other thing I'd like you to know is I'd like you to know what the whooping cough sound is like. What is that like for a patient who's struggling to breathe? Um, and children are particularly susceptible to pertussis. This is why pregnant women are encouraged to get their DTaP vaccine when they are pregnant. People who handle the newborn should, have, should be vaccinated um, with their DTaP. They should get their DTaP booster. It's every 10 years you get your DTaP boost booster and that's to prevent transmission, okay, to, to newborns who are particularly susceptible. Um, let's take a look. This newborn has whooping cough. Oops.
recommend actually rewinding that and counting how long it takes for that child to breathe. It's a long time. Um, it explains that hypoxia complication to whooping cough, that the brain damage that can result from not being able to breathe, the brain not getting the oxygen it needs um, out during that coughing fit that the baby has. So Bordetella pertussis has these sticky fimbriae hairs and they attach to the ciliated cells of our respiratory tract. Remember, that's one of our primary defenses. It's the mucociliary escalator. Remember that? So all these ciliated cells of the respiratory tract, these little finger-like projections are moving and and, and flushing, so that the, the purpose is to flush bacteria into the esophagus, out of the lungs, into the stomach, um, so that the stomach acid can degrade the bacteria. But if we have a, a virulence trait like fimbriae, then the uh, bacteria will stick to the ciliated cells and cause inflammation where the ciliated cells will become so damaged that the, um, the, the airways just become completely clogged. Okay, so now let's learn the D of the DTAP. Okay, D for the DTAP vaccine. Stands for diphtheria. It's a diphtheria toxoid. So that's the diphtheria toxoid vaccine. Okay, so the cause of diphtheria with an R naught of between six or seven, which is also extremely high, used to be the leading cause of death by infectious disease in children prior to 1935. That's prior to the vaccine. Um, the bacteria is gram positive. It's what we call pleomorphic which means it doesn't have a defined shape. So it's it's sort of rod, rod-like, but sometimes it looks more like a spiral. What happens with diphtheria? Well, it begins with a painful sore throat, progressing to a mild fever, and then eventually the bacteria start producing diphtheria toxin. And then the re immune response, so we end up getting death of our white blood cells. And then the white blood cells, as a result of the diphtheria toxin, will produce, um, they'll produce fibrin. So they'll produce this fibrin. And it's fibrin that produces this membrane in the back of the throat. So we're looking on the slide here as somebody in the back of their throat with the membrane um, that's green, gray, white patches kind of leathery. Actually, the word diphtheria comes from a word that means leather. So sort of leathery, this leathery membrane that forms in the back of the throat is an indication of diphtheria. Uh, what's happening is the patient is slowly suffocating from the result of this membrane that's covering their airways. 50% mortality rate. 
really high in children prior to the vaccine. Lots of us in, in infectious disease are scared that diphtheria is gonna make a comeback. Whooping cough has already made a comeback. So the incidence rate of whooping cough is rising. It used to be really, really low until the vaccine, um, the anti-vaccine movement became really popular in the 90s. And unfortunately, that's gonna cause a lot of problems. That's gonna cause a lot of children to unnecessarily die. And I know that sounds really harsh. And usually I try to, you know, tone down my my own personal viewpoints, but I think that the people in the anti-vax movement who are misleading and misinforming the public with false information that vaccines cause autism, which has been very clearly refuted by thousands and thousands of vaccine research studies. The people who are still trying to, to propagate this myth, this vaccine, vaccines are damaging myth, um, I, think, I think that is a huge, huge crime against humanity. Um, thousands of children are going to die and have already died unnecessarily. These are vaccine preventable, whooping cough. I've seen this video many times and every time when I see that little infant struggle to breathe, it bothers me to, to my core that people refuse still with all the information that we have, refuse to vaccinate um, their children. Okay, let's now talk about tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. It's an acid fast positive bacilli. Remember the acid fast stain? Why does it stain acid fast positive? The waxy lipids, right? The mycolic acid layer that make up its outer wall. So it's technically gram positive, but remember it also has that mycolic acid layer. This is a historical disease. Um, we know tuberculosis dates back to as long as humans have been recording human history, including ancient Egypt, um, ancient Greece, people developed tuberculosis. It shows up in a lot of historical novels and, in, um, and it was referred to as the consumption, characterized by coughing up blood very slow progression to the disease and sometimes chronic carriers. It's still a global problem. The World Health Organization takes note of those cases worldwide and there's 9 million new cases on average of tuberculosis every year and that's in modern times. That's in modern times and 2 million people die every year from tuberculosis. Why is that number so high? Well, part of the problem is that tuberculosis is one of the number one bacteria that has developed resistance to antibiotics. You see, back in the old days, before antibiotics, your likelihood of dying of tuberculosis was very, very high. Um, transmission is it's extremely contagious. So it's by aerosol transmission with an R naught between 10 and 15. Secondary infections will result from one primary infection. So somebody coughing, the bacteria stay in the air. That's called aerosol transmission. That's different than droplet. Droplet means that somebody coughs and if you're close by, that person and they say cough in your face or close to you, then you breathe it in and you get the infection. But aerosol means that somebody could have coughed and then walked away and been long gone. And you walk in and you just breathe and you breathe in the aerosolized mycobacterium and you contract the infection. 
groups. Okay, so there is a vaccine. It's not a super effective vaccine and it's only given in high risk countries. So in the United States, our levels of tuberculosis are actually relatively low, okay? Um, so mostly we're talking about um, uh, developing countries where antibiotics are not available and also there's lots of antibiotic resistance. The attenuated live um, mycobacterium bovis vaccine, uh, this is a strain of mycobacterium that's found in cattle. It's called the BCG vaccine, but the World Health Organization only recommends this for high-risk countries because it doesn't really prevent a primary infection. It prevents some of the complications that are caused by tuberculosis. The other problem with treatment is that even if you have a strain of mycobacterium that's not resistant, you need patient compliance to take six months of the antibiotic isoniazid in order to eliminate the bacteria from the body. And that's very expensive in those developing countries for people to take a six month regimen of isoniazid. Here's the disease progression of tuberculosis. And then on the next slides, I have this spelled out um, in uh, words. So we look at each stage. So again, it's, you know, it's aerosolized and you breathe it in and it eventually gets to the alveoli where it has this very sneaky trick. The very sneaky trick of mycobacterium is it invades macrophages. So there are macrophages that hang out in the alveoli and they're there to engulf bacteria. But when they engulf the mycobacterium, the mycobacterium is able to replicate inside of the alveolar macrophage. And it does this, and, and when it replicates inside of the macrophage, it also causes the macrophage to release sort of the sticky, the sticky protein on its surface. And it makes the macrophages really sticky, and they'll they'll all stick together, and they'll form this big mass of infected macrophages. That's what you're seeing here. And eventually, that mass gets so big, you can actually see it on chest X-ray. Looks like a big white sort of like baseball inside of the lungs. And that's just a whole bunch of infected macrophages and um, usually fib fibrous tissue that starts to form as a result of the inf in infection. And the interesting thing is most of the time at this stage, people are not showing any symptoms. They don't realize they have this like baseball size tubercle growing inside of their lung tissue unless they get tested which routine testing of tuberculosis is very common in schools um, and it's very common in hospitals as well. Um, but what happens is eventually that tubercle will rupture. So we see that happening here and that's called secondary tuberculosis or active TB. The, these people have the active TB. These are the people, they have a ruptured tubercle. Um, they're gonna be coughing up this bloody sputum, okay? And they're gonna have the active disease. Okay, so now let's look at the stages. Once again, written out, primary TB. Okay, so this what ha is what happens once you in inhale the mycobacterium, and we talked about they get engulfed by the macrophages. Six to eight weeks later, that's what I mean, it's a long, there's a long timeline for mycobacterium. And the tubercles form, clumps of infected macrophages, person's asymptomatic. Um, at this point, it's possible to go into a latency stage where they just remain dormant. Um, these tubercles remain dormant. There have been cases where these people, the infection clears on its own, or it just sort of hangs around um, at, this, at this point. And then what happens is that tubercle, if it does keep enlarging, um, it will rupture and all these mycobacterium are released. And that's when the person becomes symptomatic that's when it becomes very um, problematic, lots of damage in the lungs, 60% fatal if untreated. Disseminated TB is a complication of tuberculosis. So because tuberculosis can rupture out of the lungs and get into the blood, it'll start traveling. Disseminated just means to travel around. So it's traveling around and causing no good in all sorts of parts of the body including bone marrow, spleen, kidneys, brain, 
There's tubercle meningitis, an invasion of the central nervous system caused by TB. There's genital TB. Um, there's TB can get in the skin. I mean, it, it, it can get in a lot of places, and that's what we call disseminated TB. Okay, so testing. So this is what a positive TB skin test looks like. What they do, and you may have even had this test done. I've had this test done many times, mostly just because of the job choices that I have in education. So for teachers, I know at our college, teachers have to get the TB test every five years. Um, so you go into the nurse, and a lot of you will probably be doing this test in the future when you are nurses. It's sort of a bread and butter test to do as a nurse. So what you do is you give a little injection of tuberculin. So it's a protein from the, um, from the bacteria. So it's an under the skin tuberculin. It's not into a vein, okay? It's into, it's, it's right underneath the skin. So um, what's going to happen is then that tuberculin test, that TB skin test, has to be read by the nurse within 48 hours. So within 48 hours, so they'll usually have you come back in two days, in 48 hours, and what they're going to look for is a big red bump, and it's huge. If you test positive for the TB skin test, you get this very large red welt where that tuberculin was injected. And this welt usually is about um, 10 millimeters um, in size. It's pretty obvious that we have something going on here, but what it actually detects and why it takes 48 hours is what happens is that tuberculin antigen gets presented to a memory T cell and that memory T cell will activate if, okay, so if um, the patient has active TB. So what, what does it mean to have a, a positive TB skin test? For Let's think about that. So it detects memory T cells in our patient. Takes 48 hours for these guys to get clued in. So what happens is you're presenting the tuberculin as an antigen. Memory T cells, if they remember this antigen, they will activate into cytotoxic T cells and then they will attack that tuberculin protein that was injected underneath your skin. And that's why you'll get this infl inflammatory response. So it's caused by the memory cytotoxic T cells. So this will happen if the patient has, if the patient has or had TB, so this could tell you that somebody has tuberculosis currently, okay, they could be latent TB, um, or they had it. So they had tuberculosis and they recovered because remember that will also create memory cells. Um, or it will also tell you if you were vaccinated. So if you were vaccinated, which in some countries, some parts of Asia, and even Mexico vaccinate their population at birth, babies. Um, and so I've had some students say they were alarmed when they got their first TB skin test and it comes back to this huge red welt, positive, positive. Um, and of course that's always alarming because you'll have to do a follow-up test. So if you ever test positive, they'll ask you to do a follow-up test. So the follow-up test is a chest X-ray. So they'll do a chest x-ray if you test positive, but if you've been vaccinated, even if it was as a baby, so you, maybe you have no memory of it, um, that will show positive. So we followed up with the chest x-ray and we're looking for the tubercles. And that would be our secondary way to diagnose tuberculosis. And that's it for respiratory pathogens.